Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live stream. I'm Andre Marie, today's host from IFMA. While we wait for everyone to join us in this live stream, please drop a comment and tell us where you are tuning in from and say hello. So from conversations and comments by IFMA members on the Engage platform, this live stream today is the benefit of the month and a discussion prepared by our panelists around building turnover, around the building turnover process with opportunities for you to participate along the way. We are using polls through Cytog.com, and for you to answer those polling questions and get ready for the first one, you can scan that information on your screen now. And we do have a couple of things from you uh, that we need from you today. We would like for you to like this video from where you're watching. This will help us reach more FMs just like you gain insight from this kind of great content. And we also will be taking questions throughout the session today. So be sure to leave them in the chat box and we will get to them as time allows. Uh, so don't be shy, ask those questions. And if you are just joining us again, please tell us where you are tuning in from. We would love to say hello and see where uh, all of our guests are today. So I would also like to turn it over to our first panelist, Doug Littweiler, who's going to kick off today's discussion. Well, thank you, uh, Andre. Uh, I'm so glad that everybody is uh, joining us uh, today. And uh, this topic is uh, near and dear to my heart. And um, it's called Taking the Pain Out of uh, Building Turnover Processes. And uh, the uh, contents of today's program is uh, the introduction, uh, setting the stage, why are we talking about this, talking about uh, the tow experience, uh, talking about uh, tow topics, or I should say, when I refer to uh, tow, what I'm talking about is it's an acronym for Turn Over Work Group. Uh, when I was doing some experimentation on this process at a former employer, a higher uh, education facility, uh, we used that acronym so people knew what we were talking about, uh, doing uh, closing comments and then Q&A. Uh, so uh, my name is Doug Littweiler. I prefer to be called Lit. I'm the business development manager for a company called Building Maintenance Optimization Consultants. So we're headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we help organizations optimize their maintenance operation. Uh, one way we do that is by focusing on helping organizations optimize their CMMS system. Uh, we are CMMS agnostic and uh, we do not sell software. I've been a facilities professional uh, my entire career, uh, 40 plus years. I'm a mechanical engineer, graduate of Iowa State uh, University. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, my co-panelists, uh, first of which is uh, Ted Widener from Purdue. Uh, Ted, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you might be interested in this particular topic. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, Ted Widener, I'm uh, from Purdue University. I'm a professor of engineering practice which means I joined the faculty here at Purdue after about uh, 30 or more years running facilities, uh, getting them uh, planned, designed, constructed, and then maintained, and uh, hopefully improved and renewed for uh, all the occupants of the universities where I've worked. Uh, I've learned that uh, paying close attention to uh, what happens in the whole design process is very important and it requires you to think about what your end product is going to be and how you're going to take care of it, which I hope we uh, will clearly discuss today. Uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, my next uh, panelist is uh, Stephen Seller from uh, MIT. Uh, Stephen, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your interest in this particular topic. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephen Seller. I'm with uh, MIT in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, my role at MIT is uh, commissioning and turnover engineer manager. So uh, this topic is very near and dear to me as uh, we're developing a process and trying to turn over these buildings that need to last 50 to 100 years or our typical design standards. So we have high expectations over here and it's a uh, a topic that's critical to everybody's facilities and buildings as well. So looking uh, uh, forward to the discussion. Uh, I was so excited to uh, uh, meet uh, Stephen because of all of the 
uh, professionals, in, especially in higher ed, I've never met anyone who has had the word turnover in their title. And I was so excited that somebody did that because it is so critical. So I'm hoping that as a result of uh, going through this uh, program today, some of you might consider actually putting turnover in the title of uh, somebody in your organization that's going to take the bull by the horns and focus on building turnover. So, uh, uh, Stephen, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. And a lot of the source material for this uh, program uh, is coming from uh, this particular document uh, from uh, APA. And actually, uh, Ted Widener was uh, one of the editors of it. And I had the opportunity to author Chapter 15, which I think is probably the best chapter in the book, uh, Ted. I don't know what you think about that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the best chapter. And uh, I uh, was able to talk about what uh, we did at my former institution, kind of under the radar screen. Uh, but if you want to act, get access uh, to that, you can look, if you have this book, you can check chapter 15. Uh, also, if you uh, would like a copy of this particular chapter, send me an email, and I will send that to you. It goes into a little bit more detail on uh, the, the turnover process uh, as we worked on it at my former uh, employer. So setting the stage. <clears throat> uh, this is... Uh, my attempt to develop a definition of what building turnover uh, process is. And just let me uh, verbalize it here. Uh, the planned and orderly process of holistically preparing a newly constructed building or major renovation, the building operations team, and the building's future occupants for the eventual occupation and operation of the new building. Uh, building turnover, uh, you know, is really so much more than this, but if you had to condense it in a paragraph, this is how lit uh, would define it. And I'm going to give uh, Ted and Stephen uh, uh, an opportunity here, uh, albeit briefly. Uh, did I hit the nail on the head here? Let's start with Ted. Uh, how would you uh, cl uh, cl classify or define building turnover? Uh, building turnover really is... Uh... The, the planning of how the building is going to be taken care of uh, following the construction, uh, taking care of the building, making sure how people know how to, to operate or, or do their jobs within the building, not just the people who maintain the building, but the people who occupy it, so that things really work more smoothly if they know how they're supposed to work with those folks who maintain the building and, and keep it operational for their comfort and for their uh, overall work efficiency. Uh, Stephen, uh, what's your take on the definition of building turnover? The turnover is a, a process that should be followed, I think, and um, try to, to do as good as possible um, with providing the right information, tools, skill sets, personnel, equipment to maintain and, uh, and, and keep the building operating and, and fully, um, fully occupied, right? That's the, that's the goal. People want to build these buildings and use them. And if they're not working right, then chances are they're not going to be occupied. So I think, you know, the turnover ensures that the life of the building gets used um, uh, throughout its whole life, right? And, and to extend it as far as possible. Well, thank you, Stephen. Um, polling question, uh, Ted? Yeah, so one of the important questions to ask is when does the process start for your company? Does it start at the beginning of design, at completion of design, design or start of construction at substantial completion, or does it never happen? And the, uh, the responses seem to be focused mostly on substantial completion as opposed to when I would recommend at the beginning of design. Um, this is uh, an answer that I fully expected, uh, which I actually am glad that I'm seeing this because it uh, hopefully means that some of the messages we're delivering today is going to change this such that... Uh, uh, the 60% is going to show up at the completion of design. Uh, so that's, it's very interesting. Uh, Stephen, mm -hmm. any comments on the results? Yeah, kind of. I wasn't expecting this just from my background and where I come from. I know that, that we try and do it right at the beginning of design and 
that's just what what I've been doing. So I'm kind of surprised, but I'm I'm not that surprised because the industry lags behind a lot, and and hopefully part of what we're doing today will help educate people to uh, to begin thinking about this early on and and be more successful. Um, the next slide is uh, uh, a quote. I've got two quotes from uh, Mr. Duke in here. Uh, he had an article uh, back in 2015 in Health Facilities uh, Management Magazine, and he hit the nail on the head. Uh, uh, him and I, I think, all like failure to prepare operationally prior to moving into a space designed for a set workflow can upset the financial parameters on which the project was approved. It can also create a negative perception of the project delivery team's performance, even if all the building systems are functioning properly. And uh, uh, Mr. Duke really hit the nail on the head here. And I'm going to uh, you know, admit that uh, as we go through this presentation, I am going to uh, be focusing on the position of the people that are going to be operating the building and uh, maintaining it. Uh, I'm not going to be the voice of the people that are designing and constructing the building. I'm really coming from the operational aspects of the, team, of the uh, project. And I also want to mention that uh, there are 200 people that are have registered for this uh, webinar, which definitely indicates that this is a very important uh, topic for many, many people. And through the course of uh, my career, I've seen it over and over again that this, is, this process creates a lot of angst and anxiety for especially the operational team members, and it doesn't have to be that way. And uh, you, uh, when I was at my former employer, you know, there was definitely uh, indication that uh, we needed to find a better way for building turnover. And uh, during a, a, a recent decade, uh, we invested over a billion dollars in new construction and we were turning over buildings right and left. And uh, the second day I was on the job, uh, somebody came up to me and says, hey, we're getting all these really neat buildings, uh, but what we end up is uh, getting turned over to us a uh, pardon the French here, a manure sandwich. He didn't use the word manure, uh, but that is how he reflected. I said, man, that's awful. And uh, that has stuck to me to this day, that we have to find a better way of uh, doing it. And uh, one of the things uh, that I've observed, and I'm so sure many of you have, have observed, that when you go into a project, there's a real uh, evidence of tunnel vision. The focus is the, the design and construction of the physical facility. That's the focus and the financial aspects. Very little focus on what's going to happen to the building once the keys are turned over to the operational team members. And, and uh, one of my goals is to try to change that conversation and uh, eliminate this uh, myopic uh, tunnel vision view of what a project is. And uh, for most people, especially the folks that design and construct the building, uh, this is what a building looks like. You know, the building lasts, uh, let's say, from one to four years, uh, depending on the, uh, uh, the complexity and the size of the building. But we need to focus on the building life cycle. The building life cycle is far longer than that short period of time when the building is under design and commissioned. So uh, it's, it's my uh, focus and my message that everybody involved in the project, especially the designers and the constructors, need to realize that your part of the building is so small uh, compared to the life of the building that you really need to provide some um, focus on uh, what you can do to help the operators and maintainers and occupants uh, to cure that building going forward. And uh, we, uh, we, I almost talk, we, the operation team members and the occupants, uh, we need a seat at the table. If we don't have that seat at the table, uh, the building is not going to be uh, operated as optimally as it could be. The occupants aren't going to be as happy as they could be. So we need a seat at the table. Uh, Stephen, from your perspective, do you have a seat at the table at MIT? Yes, yes. Yeah, we're the ones uh, orchestrating the seating. So yeah. we make sure that all the departments get um, get asked to attend and provide input as to what's important to them in the individual buildings and make sure that we carry that forward and back to the design team and the contractors, right? The contractors typically have one goal is to build it as quickly as possible and get out, right? It's not the same goal as, as us uh, or the owners taking care of the building. So I think that's important to realize um, when, when establishing the group that needs to be at the table is that 
it's not just the team that builds it it's the team that uses it right the custodial staff the um the the, the trash collection where where that gets handled how it gets handled these are all important topics that that people seem to easily forget so i think that that's real important to not just take the typical people that you see at a, at a contractor's meeting or a design build meeting. These are different individuals who need um, and require different aspects of, of the building to operate for them. Uh, Ted, uh, based on your experience, uh, uh, talk about what you see of uh, the operations team members, uh, the operational stakeholders having a seat at the table. Uh, has it been hit and miss based on your career? Yeah, and a lot of times I would uh, work on moving it from miss to hit. Uh, and there's a number of ways of doing it. Uh, you can develop a uh, very detailed uh, set of building design requirements so that the designers know the right way to design the building, telling them uh, what the minimum size of a custodial closet needs to be, and should there be any storage for custodians within the building. Uh, or you might uh, go into all kinds of other detail of saying exactly how uh, different electrical or HVAC systems need to be uh, connected together uh, so that uh, the workers know how to, to maintain it and, and know what to expect. Now, some of that is is detrimental because you want to get the latest design uh, information from the uh, consultants. But at the same time, uh, your workers need to know what they're going to be uh, expected to maintain and uh, how to get to the facility and how to move around in the mechanical room. Because some workers are not as small as uh, the designers leave room for them to get to maintain the, the facilities. Uh, Stephen, did you have a comment? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, a lot of times we think we know what we want in the building, and that's not always necessarily the case either, right? So it's it's helping make sure that we get what we actually want and not just following a standard that says this is what we need. Every building is unique and has its own aspects that have to be looked at, and I think that's an important topic too that uh, a lot of people forget and don't include in anything, right? Oh, uh, one other thing I want to mention uh, to the audience here is that because this is such a, a large topic and is of such great interest and you could go a variety of ways uh, and get, really get into the weeds, right now we're just going to be hitting the surface. So as you go through this uh, webinar, I want you to keep in mind uh, on how we can continue this conversation and really get into some uh, details on how to optimize this turnover process because i really want to uh, change the industry on how buildings are turned over so please think about uh, how we can uh, continue this conversation after this uh, webinar so uh, and i'd love i'd love to hear your feedback <coughs> ted oh we've got another question what is the greatest risk if the turnover is not done well do new assets suffer from the lack of maintenance or uh, are there added costs of operation or maybe there's some other unforeseen problems that we haven't listed here? So there's an awful lot of focus right now in the responses on added cost of operation. And I would say, yeah, that's very true that there is an added cost of operation but uh, operational costs don't only come from uh, poor turnover of a facility. Uh, a lot of operational costs are founded in the uh, utility consumption, uh, but there's other costs associated with uh, not turning over a facility well. Like for instance, it might take longer to figure out what's the problem with a piece of equipment that might not be working correctly today. Uh, and your labor costs can be very significant if your uh, maintenance staff doesn't know what to expect in advance, hasn't been trained, uh, or is unfamiliar with uh, debugging a condition as quickly as you'd like them to. Uh, one thing I'd like to comment on is added cost of operation. And uh, this focus is, uh, or my comment is related to uh, uh, orientation of the future occupants of the building. Uh, one of the things that I've seen 
is that if the future occupants haven't went through some sort of orientation of how their new workspaces work, how the lights work, how the HVAC system works, how the new automatic shades on the windows work, what we find is that the uh, new occupants are going to call the work control center and say, hey, my lighting system doesn't work. I don't know how to work it, or uh, I want to qu uh, stop my shades from going up and on automatically. And this creates an, act, uh, an added workload on the technicians that are responsible for maintaining the building. Uh, so that really uh, focuses on added costs of operation that people really aren't aware of if the turnover, and especially the orientation of the new occupants, isn't done properly. And that's something that is often overlooked. Yeah, I'd like to add something to that, too, Lynn. Um, sure. You know, us, you know, our, 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 our personnel and, and staff at, at MIT is unique and sometimes just understanding how thermostats work with the dead band and the offset. Some people think 68 is warm while others think it's freezing, right? Depending on, on where they come from and what they're, what they're used to. So I think that's real important to make sure that the users understand how to use the building and the way it was designed, whether it's right or wrong, the way it was designed and the way it's going to operate. So. So one of the things I'm hoping everybody takes away from this webinar is always consider as part of the turnover process orienting the future occupants and actually take them potentially on a tour of the facility before they are actually moved in. So by the time they move in, they are familiar and comfortable with their new uh, digs. Well, and uh, along those lines, uh, one thing that I've done before was to uh, have my staff put together a manual, just a brief one, that uh, told the occupants how the building operated, who key contacts were, if they had a particular problem, uh, what phone number to call. Uh, and we had a, this little manual, it may have been only uh, eight or 16 pages, and we put it down on the desk for every new occupant coming into the building. And so if even after they got their orientation, if they happened to forget something, they could look at the little manual that we gave them and figure out the right way to request some kind of repair or uh, corrective work. Um, next slide, uh, the, the toe experiment. Uh, again, uh, a lot of this, uh, the discussion we're talking about today, uh, you know, I had uh, did a little experiment in my former place of employment on how we could develop a turnover process that's more effective. So I kind of did this uh, under the radar screen, uh, but really focused on uh, helping the operations team members and uh, future stakeholders uh, get a sense of, uh, of uh, this building. So uh, this is the results of uh, my experiment. Uh, so uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, emphasize here is that the turnover work group or the turnover process is focused on the stakeholders and communication. It is not focused necessarily on the physical structure. That's the role of the design team and the construction team. TOW is about the stakeholders that are going to be operating and maintaining the building. So I want to make that distinction. This is not a duplication of the project uh, meetings. Uh, this is uh, in addition to. Uh, so I'm going to have this slide coming up later again to uh, uh, have an exclamation point. Uh, so I wanted you to take a look at the faces of these uh, operational stakeholders. On the left is what the stakeholders look like if you don't have an effective turnover process. And on the right is what the stakeholders look like uh, after you go through a well-planned turnover. As you can see, uh, I would prefer to uh, have the stakeholders look like they do on the right side of the screen than they do on the left. Uh, and I'll, I'd like to uh, compare and contrast uh, the turnover uh, process with what would be considered a, a typical uh, commissioning portion. And a lot of people think, uh, and you can talk a little bit about this, Stephen, is uh, Commissioning is often looked at as, as part of the turnover. Uh, but what I'd like to propose is that uh, this is what the tow program looks like. It runs in parallel uh, with the entire project, but the focus is different. If the focus is operating the building, the focus is not making sure that the building assets work properly. So it's not duplicative. 
and all the things that happen under the uh, the tow bar are going to happen whether or not there's anybody managing the process. Uh, the key is to manage the process. And don't let the process manage you because all these things will happen regardless. But let's make them happen in an organized and uh, designed way. Uh, Stephen, comments. Yeah, no, this is something that, that we follow or try to follow closely and um, and work with. So it shows that, you know, the turnover process starts early on. And the whole effort is to get all the, the documents and the training and everything that, you know, the final C of O needs and then that we need internally to set up the asset management, to set up the PM uh, IDs um, or the PM programs, actually and the asset IDs associated with that and make sure the equipment's on hand. So it all goes toward that, but there's a lot of details in here and it's almost impossible for one person to, to, to be able to control this. It needs a team, like a true team of people dedicated to follow this, to make sure that it's done effectively and efficiently. Uh, we have a, a comment here uh, by uh, Mark uh, Jacobus uh, about uh, Legacy records such as history of uh, maintenance and uh, okay, okay, that's comments on here. Uh, yeah, one of the things that we're going to talk about here uh, later in this webinar is the importance of educating the stakeholders about uh, how to properly operate and maintain these systems and how to document uh, uh, maintenance work on these systems. So yeah, this is definitely is something that is uh, of critical nature as part of the tow process to make sure all, all of the stakeholders understand what they have in their system, how to maintain them, and why they are important, and what systems uh, they they control. So, uh, yeah. thank you, Mark. Yeah, and we've been we've been just on that topic. We've been making a push lately on the last couple um, large capital projects on campus to get the PM requirements when the equipment's approved. We're not waiting for the O and M's to come in. We're asking them for those five or six pages early on, so we can get it into our PM records and get that ready. So on day one of occupancy we're ready to, to, to move and have the equipment and, and a process and a plan in place to take care of that asset. So I think that's a really good topic to make sure that, that it gets transferred and in the right places, because it's not the same teams who build these, who maintains them typically. Well, and as uh, another point on that, you, you can only maintain what you really know about mm. and you don't mm. want to have the information on what's in the building uh, changed because somebody had to rekey it. So it's really important with the design of the project and with the construction for both the design and the construction parties to know what you expect to receive mm. so you can automatically transfer all the information about uh, the building components into the work management system or the integrated work management system. Because if you have to rely on somebody to go and rekey all the information where the contractor provided you several volumes of of information about what's in the building you you run the risk of having an error put in and not knowing the right model number or not knowing uh, what that piece of equipment is at all uh, getting it all organized in advance particularly if you use building information modeling is extremely helpful yeah, that could be another topic, I think, because getting that information yeah. from the construction over to the operation side is a huge task. I know we run into this problem all the time. We're trying to integrate now our commissioning software to automatically import into our asset tagging. And we're having a lot of problems getting that process done. We're working through them now, but it's, it's a larger task than simply just to, even if you gather it once, everybody doesn't trust it. Everybody goes back and redoes it. So... I think that there's a lot of inefficiencies in that task by itself. Uh -huh. uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight here, I put a box uh, under uh, a target here. And uh, as people uh, are going through the design phase of a building, I think it's really critical that everybody realizes that one of the key outcomes uh, is at the uh, point of certificate of occupancy or substantial completion or building turnover where you're actually turning the keys over is at that point, uh, the first PM work order can be issued and people can start issuing corrective work orders uh, for the new assets in the building. 
Uh, mm-hmm. So I would like, I would challenge every one of you to make sure that that goal is in place so that you can start maintaining a maintenance history on that building the day that is turned over. Oftentimes, uh, this asset management function is overlooked, and sometimes you don't get the uh, work orders issued for two years. Or the PMs are not even developed for two years, which is absolutely unacceptable. And if you go back uh, to the left on the timeline, I've got an item here, initiate asset management plan activities. You need to start working on developing the asset management plan way early in the construction phase. And uh, one of the things that BMOC does, if we have the opportunity to work with the customer on uh, adding uh, these new assets into the CMMS, uh, we like to have a seat at the table at the, uh, at the submittal exchange portal. So while the uh, uh, submittals come in, uh, we can start looking at uh, the submittals and the OM information, whatever might happen to be uh, delivered by the contractors. We can see that during the construction phase, so we can be preparing the PM procedures during the construction phase, so by the time the building is turned over, uh, that on that day, PMs can start coming out. So I want to really hammer home the importance of understanding you got to start this asset management program development early on in the project. And again, I want to emphasize uh, this process runs in parallel and it is not duplicative of the building construction and commissioning process. Uh, so uh, who is part of a uh, building or a successful turnover work group? I identified here a number of people that can be part of it and a number of the types of tasks that should be discussed uh, during uh, the turnover process. I will get into these in a little bit more detail. And I believe it's, uh, oh, it's not time for the full question. That's coming up later. Okay, I want to give you a few characteristics of uh, the, the, the tow process, and then we'll get into some more detail. A tow should be led by a member representing the operations team. It is not a function of the building project team or the contractors or the designers. Who knows better on how to lead this process than uh, somebody representing operations? Uh, it is not the task of the designers or the contractors to uh, develop this process. It's part of operations, and, uh, and that should happen uh, starting early on in the design phase. Uh, TOE should start early in the design phase, and again, I want to emphasize it is not duplicative of the regular project meetings. I heard some uh, complaints uh, or some pushback when I was doing this experiment that uh, we already have project team meetings. Uh, we don't want, we don't have time to do focus on another meeting focusing on turnover. Well, uh, the turnover is going to happen whether or not you plan it. It's far better off to plan it to make the turnover process smooth. Uh, management support is required. Uh, you really need uh, to lobby the, uh, uh, the AVP of facilities or the director of facilities that this has to happen in conjunction with the typical project team. If you don't get management support, it may not happen or it may have to happen under the radar screen. Uh, but it's got to happen. You've got to have management support hold uh, as part of the tow process hold participants accountable. Uh, we spent a lot of time when we were talking about tasks that needed to be completed relative to turnover is who, by name, is going to do what to find the specific deliverable and by when, a specific date. If we just say, well, somebody needs to do something by a certain date, hopefully somebody's going to step up to the plate. That will never work. Uh, documentation. Uh, we, uh, take detailed notes of these meetings and who's going to be doing what, what we talked about, and try to distribute the minutes within 48 hours of the uh, meeting. Uh, I believe this goes back to one of the poll questions. Uh, focus on preventing issues. We want to do our very best to be proactive, identify potential issues that be, could, could be compounded if you continue to ignore that issue, anticipate issues early, and deal with them early. And finally, have the right stakeholders engaged at the right time. Uh, this is so critical. So the whole tool process, there's gonna be a whole variety of players and stakeholders coming in and out depending on uh, the status of the construction, 
what's happening at any given time. So uh, you, you're not going to have 15 people present at every meeting all the time. You need to have the right people there at the right time that can provide the right input. So uh, Ted and uh, Stephen, I'd like to uh, open this up for some commentary uh, from you on what we just discussed. <laughs> Yeah, I well, think this is the heart of the matter, right? I think this is this is trying to establish um, the right group, the right people, the right input, um, and and it's for every building built, right? We're we're fortunate enough that we build multiple buildings, but I would think that this would even be um, more important or more critical for somebody who only builds a building once and needs to have it last, and that's their le legacy, and who don't have the experience, right? Um, and, and who don't have an idea of how to start this. So I think anybody you think who's going to be in the building needs to have a seat at the table. Um, it, it's critical from, you know, from the admin, from the people paying the bills to the people taking care of the building. I think everybody needs to be there. There's no such thing as, oh, they're not critical to the building. There's no yeah. such thing as that. The other thing to, to point out, and, and you mentioned it really in uh, item number five, and that is, it's really a management task to get this done the right way. And the good management of personnel is to know who's going to be doing uh, a task, what that specific task is, and when they're going to be delivering it. And that's all management. Yeah. Don't think of this as being engineering or yeah. architecture or maintenance. It's a management process that has to be handled the right way. Oh, hear, hear. I, I salute. Uh, that one, uh, Ted. And, uh, and holding people accountable, yeah. right. That's, that's right. the big thing is, is getting dates and, hey, you promised this and, and holding them. It's not, it's not oh, we'll get it to you when we get it to you that you hear in so many of the construction meetings, right? It, this is like, no, we need an answer. We need to move forward on this. And this is how we're going to do it. And somebody to take ownership of it. Uh, we have a, a comment uh, from uh, Derek Hillestad. Uh, hi, Derek. Uh, long time, no talk. Uh, <laughs> He indicates they've seen time and time again face-to-face -face training with no recording or ability to revisit uh, training delivery. And we're going to be touching on that a little bit later in the uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that's very important is uh, during the discussion, way early on during construction, designing the training program, uh, if in fact you want to record the training program, you need to make sure you understand where this recording is going to happen. It's going to happen in the mechanical room. It's going to happen in a conference room. If you want to record it, uh, what kind of equipment do you need? Is it going to be too much background noise such that if you have this training in the mechanical room, what typically happens, recording it is going to be very difficult unless you have uh, the uh, uh, educator or the, the trainer mic'd properly. But that's why, relative to training, start the design process early in the construction phase uh, and really de 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 design it so it's going to work. I think uh, uh, videotaping these uh, training sessions is great. However, if uh, there's so much background noise that you, can, you can't hear the uh, instructor uh, during the training recording, it's worthless. So, and, uh, St Stephen, yeah. uh, you want to address that? Yeah, you know, and this is a great topic as well. Um, you know, I think that, you know, training, is it true training or is it familiarization, right? How much training, you know, taking apart a pump or a bearing or a fan, how much do the guys really do anymore? Or is it knowing where the equipment is and how to isolate it in case of an emergency? Mm -hmm. And is that still called training? I don't, you know, I, I we, we struggle with this all the time and we, you know, lately now with uh, with 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 COVID and and the challenges, you know, we're finding that the videotaping sessions work awesome. But what do you want on that information? Yeah. You know, I make it a point that to point out the room we're in, what's in the room, and how to make it safe. You know, those are the key th features for 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 us in um, in the R and M side, at least for emergencies and things like that. Right? What do we do? How do we react? How quickly can we get the information out? So. It's knowing what you want to get trained on and what you want those training sessions to involve, right? Yeah, and uh, the, the polling question of who should be involved in the turnover process, uh, all of the above uh, seems to be uh, the most popular answer. Uh, there's an awful lot of stuff that has to be done 
uh, for the turnover so that people know how to take care of the building and so that uh, maybe the finance folks are involved uh, setting up the right contracts uh, in advance to maintain, to make sure the building is maintained when it is turned over. Because not necessarily every organization takes care of their own maintenance. They may hire different contractors and they may need to know exactly what uh, skill sets those contractors have to have for the different parts of the facility. Yeah, uh, Ted and uh, Stephen, one of the things that really surprises me here, I know we've only got uh, 10 uh, that have uh, participated, is 0% for custodial. Uh, and I want to uh, set the record straight here that uh, uh, custodial is probably one of the more important uh, stakeholders to uh, uh, be involved in the turnover process because uh, the custodial team touches so many things within that building. And we'll talk a little bit more about why the custodial team members should be part of this turnover process. But uh, I'm a little surprised that that only got zero. Yeah, and their, their equipment seems to be bigger now, too, like to clean the floors and to move around and just waste paper barrels. Like there's a lot of things in there. The rooms have to get pretty big. I know we did a building on campus a few years ago that uh, – required like a, a ride on tractor trailer pretty much to, to, yeah. to, to do the floors. and nobody thought about it so we, we we had to modify the design to accommodate what they needed and we couldn't get it up from floor to floor either so every floor needed to have a room like that so it was quite challenging and it, it would have been a big miss had we not spoke to them before when they moved in and wanted to take care of that that surface and couldn't do it right yeah well and it's also important to remember custodians are typically in the building every single day. They are your eyes and ears for problems and whether and they detect the leak early on and start calling people in or whether they notice that something isn't just working right the way they're accustomed to, they are your front line. And if you don't make sure that they know what's going on, it's going to be more costly and it'll take you longer and you're going to have some unhappy customers as a result. Yeah, I want to hammer this custodial thing one more uh, one more point is that that's why it's so critical to have the custodial team present in discussions during the design phase uh, for the uh, purposes of, uh, as you uh, mentioned, Stephen, is the equipment that the custodial team members use are so sophisticated these days and so large that some of it even semi-automated that the design team has to understand what kind of uh, equipment is the custodial team members going to need and uh, do they have space in the building to, number one, maintain this, this equipment, more importantly, store them. Uh, and it, it's not just a, uh, a custodial closet anymore. I mean, it, it's almost like a mechanical room yeah. uh, for custodial equipment. And it's so easy to give that short shrift uh, so if nothing else, if you get out of this webinar, uh, pay attention to what the custodial team members need, uh, as Ted and uh, Stephen both yeah. mentioned. They need, they need power. They need, you know, charging stations for, for their batteries, for their equipment. There's a whole bunch of issues that come in there. Then they need cooling in the room. So it leads to bigger design issues than you think of just giving them a space to store something. And, and with so many custodial uh, teams now, uh, because of uh, budget constraints or what have you, an increasing use of robotic equipment where the uh, one person gets the piece of equipment started and then it starts running around and then they have to clean that piece of equipment at the end of the day. Uh, they may need plumbing, they may need waste lines, they may need chemical dispensing and so on. It's not all automatic. There's still a lot of uh, care and feeding associated with a lot of the robotic equipment that's around. Uh, John Thomas uh, had a comment here. How many kits, floor machines, burnishers, where to store, how many FDEs uh, to uh, hire? We'll be addressing that in the uh, upcoming slide on all the, uh, I think I've got a uh, entire slide dedicated to the custodial team uh, uh, situation. So we'll be addressing that here soon. Uh, I've got on the screen here uh, potential tow membership. Uh, who who should be uh, at least present at some point during the tow process? Again, uh, not all of these have to be present all the time, but many of them do. 
Uh, some of them come and go, but the key is to know what the status is of the construction uh, by leveraging the uh, participation by the construction manager in the upper right-hand corner. We always like to see that person present at these tow meetings, but these are a lot of the stakeholders that should have a say at some point or presence at some point during the, the tow process. And we'll get into a little bit more of this uh, coming up. Uh, so uh, tow topics. So we're going to go over these uh, very quickly because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> we can get into the weeds in so many of these. But we're going to keep this at high level. So at some point during the tow uh, process, uh, these topics are going to be coming up. And these are not all inclusive. Uh, I'm highlighting the critical ones that we uh, tended to focus on when we were doing this uh, experiment. Uh, so here's the list of uh, discussion topics, and uh, I'll hit, we'll hit we'll hit these uh, one by one here uh, in just a moment. Uh, first of all, uh, every tow meeting we had this opening statement. We encouraged everyone that was there if they have an issue with something going on with the construction, if they deter if they saw something that bothered them, or if they saw some sort of construction technique that was bothering them, and they weren't getting the response they wanted from the construction uh, uh, manager, the key is to uh, deliver that issue or that concern through your uh, uh, management food chain and let your managers go to fight for that. Uh, but don't say, well, I told the construction manager he didn't do anything, so I don't care. It's management. Uh, it, it, that's not the right way of uh, approaching it. If it's important, uh, run it up your food chain and have your manager or your director go to bat for you. We always talked about what is the date of substantial completion and what is the date of final completion. So all the stakeholders know at any given time what the schedule is. It's often easy to uh, kind of overlook schedule, you know, the project is going on, it's going to re be completed sometime uh, fourth quarter 2023. Now we talk about that date every tow meeting. Existing FM operations personnel, uh, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, Ted and Stephen, so if you have a comment, uh, just shout out. Uh, who by name, preferably, is going to be involved in the operations of that specific building? Uh, what is their role and responsibilities, and when do they need to get involved? To the extent you can identify by name who is going to be maintaining that building, the sooner the better, so they can uh, get a, a sense on uh, what they need to know to, uh, to maintain and operate the building. Uh, what's even more important is new hires. Do you have the staff already on hand to maintain the new building? I doubt if you do. Uh, but if you don't, uh, you need to start focusing on who do you need, where do you need it, and have these uh, positions uh, been uh, budgeted, when do these new people need to be on board, and who's going to be responsible for preparing the new hires, uh, new hire requisitions, and preparing the new hire. You're hiring a company to make sure that they know what they're going to be responsible for right so if you guys you know and are, don't have the personnel and staff and you're going to outside contract it you got to bring them to the table so they know what to budget and how to charge you and how to set up your billing and you need to be clear on what you expect them to do uh in a perfect oh go ahead Ted. and and if you're uh going to figure out how to hire your own staff uh you you can use some uh, publications that APA has prepared on both custodial and maintenance and grounds uh, and take the time to find the right people who can handle the, the job and uh, spend the time that your HR department is going to require for finding those people. And in the, these days of uh, having difficulty finding uh, uh, labor, it's very important to start this process early. Uh, project walkthroughs, you know, again, this is typically coordinated through the project team, but this is an opportunity for the people that participate in the walkthroughs to talk to the other uh, stakeholders. Uh, what did they see? What issues did they find? Uh, what's going to happen as a follow up? Uh, and a lot of times now, project walkthroughs could be done virtually. There's some great software out there that allow you not to even shut down the job site or have to go to the job site if you're in a different city or country there's a lot of great in tools out there that could be used to, to view everything so you don't physically have to be on site to see the walkthroughs or the see the condition of the building as it's being designed and built now but but if you don't have uh all of those technologies available it really helps to have the uh 
electrical and mechanical folks go through the building before you start covering up all the stuff that they have to take care of yeah. behind wallboard and ceilings and so on. Make sure the right backing's there to make sure everything that you think is there is, you know, in the right place and, and works right. A good time to, to, to do that is around the inspection time, right? Before they close up the walls or ceiling inspections, rough in, whatever. That's the time to have your guys go out as well and, and, and see what, what, you know, what's important to them and make sure that it's taken care of before it's too late to, to repair or address. Right. Uh, here's my uh, famous uh, custodial waste recycling slide. I wanted to highlight a couple items. Uh, it's so critical for the uh, designers to talk to the custodial team members about what kind of finishes are going to be installed, uh, what kind of tools will the custodial team members need to maintain these new finishes. Maybe there's a new finish that the custodial team has never seen before, which is going to require some special solutions. You don't want to use their a typical solution to uh, clean a window that has a super duper special coating, uh, which that uh, solution that they normally use will destroy the coating. That's why this has to happen really early on. You don't, you want to make sure the custodial team members are plugged in. Uh, asset management program development, and we talked about this earlier. It's so important to begin this process. Uh, again, uh, talk, start talking about it during the design phase on what's going to have to happen to make sure that the CMS has uh, the proper PMs for all these new assets, that the assets are inventoried and tagged, and making sure that the assets that are supposed to be there are actually there uh, pre preferably be done by a uh, physical inspection, uh, making sure that the O&Ms have been collected uh, and uh, make sure that all this, the plan is being started to be developed during the design phase. You don't want to start this three months before a uh, building turnover. And, and yeah, and test that all the systems communicate correctly is, is important. Don't, don't assume that everything's going to function and that it's all seamless to get the information from one, from one place yeah. to another. And that the technicians have access to it when they're in the field performing the PMs, that they can actually see what the requirements are. Because software doesn't necessarily communicate well to each other. Uh, I got a, a good comment uh, from uh, Joe DiRecco. Uh, he's part of a construction data collection team. Uh, this is a whole hour in and of itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, so, Joe, if you'd be so kind as to drop me an email, I'd like to carry that conversation offline uh, because uh, I could talk an hour for an hour on uh, that question. So thanks for that question. <laughs> it's very important. Uh, some more asset manager program development, uh, not going uh, through all of these point by point. Uh, you'll have access to the slides and the recording later. And uh, now one, you know, we'll go one ahead. point, sorry, Doug. Um, one key point on this, you know, any information that you think you're going to want, we've been trying to make a, 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 a charge into getting our commissioning agents to get that in as part of the pre-functional checklist or the contractors, you know, they own getting this information. So it's knowing what's important to your organization or what's important to your CMS software that you need to, to, to get and let them collect it for you. They own, they look at it all the time. So it's real important that you know what you want and not ask for 85 pages of stuff you're never going to use. Ask for the half page of things that you're actually going to use and and, and need. You know, we started asking now for consumables mm. and, and you know, filter sizes, types, you know, normal stuff, but also consumables. So guys go out there with the right oil or uh, lubricants that, that they need for that equipment. Um, FM. Team uh, training, this is so critical, and I want to highlight a couple of points. Uh, number one, uh, the operations team determines the schedule of training, not the contractors. Uh, you know, take a look at uh, Ida, uh, uh, check, mark, uh, check mark number four. You determine when the, your, the your team is going to be available. Don't, say, don't allow the contractor to say, hey, we've got a guy available to train. We're going to do it tomorrow at 4 o'clock not acceptable and this should be in the, the specifications another thing i wanted to uh, focus on is uh check mark number three ask the contractor to provide the credentials of the trainer for your approval uh so often uh they have somebody who's a body who's available who knows nothing about the asset that they're going to be talking about uh, but it's going to fulfill the contract documents uh have the right to say no this guy has no business during this training uh, come up with somebody else. And again, uh, uh, this is a topic in and of itself. We could spend an hour at least just talking about training. But this has to be designed. Start talking about it. 
during the design phase with your operational stakeholders present. Yeah. And if it's not done right, don't be afraid to stop it and, and make yeah. them do it again. You know what I mean? Don't 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 be afraid to say, hey, this isn't working. I don't need to buy a new pump. I need to know how the pump works that you sold me. Yep. So, you know, have have some of that, have make sure that the people organizing it and the CM and everybody is behind you with that. But don't just accept what they put in front of you. Uh, new occupant orientation. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Please think about developing a program to train or orient the new occupants. Make them feel comfortable and confident in their new workspaces. Uh, I, think, I think it should be all occupants, right? Because occupants oh. sometimes get resurfaced. I don't think it's just new. I think it's just occupants uh, orientation okay, yeah. would be better because we have a big turnover rate or new people coming in, you know, all the time. So it's not uh, a one new, thing. Uh, new tools and equipment. Uh, this discussion has to happen early on. Are, are there special tools that are going to be required, either custodial or maintenance, that are going to have to be purchased uh, way early on to make sure that they are in place uh, and available to use the day the building is turned over? And this discussion needs to happen real early on. And one of the big issues here, who's going to pay for this new equipment? And when does it have to be ordered? So if it happens during the, uh, the design phase, uh, the project team can include the, that budget in their budget and not require the operations team to pull these funds out of their operating budget, which are typically constrained. Uh, warranty management, service contracts, need to have that discussed early on so when the building is turned over, people are aware of what the, their responsibilities are relative to warranty and uh, service contracts. One of the things that's important is that there's sometimes in the specs, unbeknownst to the operation team, uh, the designers have put in there that this particular asset is going to have a service contract delivered by the uh, company that provides it. Uh, the uh, the technicians may have no knowledge of that, so the technicians have been maintaining that for five years when in reality a uh, surface contract, uh, contract was supposed to be maintaining it. Mm -hmm. Attic stock management. What kind of uh, attic stock do you want? Do you really need it? If you need it, where are you going to put it? Uh, is, is it going to age out over time? Uh, attic stock is something that is typically given short shrift. Yeah. Uh, safety mm -hmm. issues. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that in any great detail, but this is something that needs to be a discussion within the tow team and uh, in conjunction with the construction manager. Uh, waste stream management, recycling, landfill, compost, hazardous material, biohazards. How are you going to get from uh, where the waste is generated to where the waste is disposed of? What's the, uh, the path the custodial team has to take? And some more waste stream management. Focus on this during the design phase. Other topics, uh, as conditions warrant, uh, we're pushing the end of the hour here. Uh, uh, successful project, uh, another Patrick uh, Duke uh, a quote, um, you can look at that yourself. Uh, let's begin the project with the end in mind. Uh, and we'll be sending out the slides, so don't, don't worry about reading them right now as well, sorry. Uh, the turnover process belongs to the operations team. Uh, don't manage a turnover process simply by adding words. Uh, oftentimes, people think that if I just add enough words in the spec, everything will run smoothly. Uh, never happens. Don't do that as a substitution for having a well-designed turnover process. Uh, start planning for building turnover in the design phase. Get buy-in from leadership. Commissioning the building is only a component of a holistic uh, I should say the traditional commissioning is only a component of a holistic uh, turnover. Uh, counter the argument that we don't have time to dedicate the resources to this effort. It's going to happen. You, you're going to make time whether you want to or not. Well, and the standard comment on that is if you don't have the time to do it right the first time, then how do you have the time to do it the second time? <laughs> oh, well, well said. Or does again, the first time ever finish? <laughs> <laughs> and again, Tow is about stakeholders and communicating. It's not about necessarily the physical building. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, the slide deck is going to be provided by IFMA. Uh, if you have, want any more information about what we talked about, uh, you know, please uh, give me a call, drop me an email. Uh, and uh, I'd like some feedback on the best way of continuing this discussion. And uh, we did just a Q&A. Sorry we're out of time. but. Thank you so much for your attention today, and I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion and getting in the weeds at a later date. Andre?
Are you muted, Andre? Yeah, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Thank you uh, all for uh, who tuned in today. And a special thanks to you, to you guys, Doug, Ted, and Stephen, for lending us your expertise and insights into this building turnover process. As uh, Doug stated, uh, you will be emailed the slide deck if you have registered. The link for that registration has been dropped in the comments if you want to get uh, this slide deck. And if you haven't already done so, please like this video that you're watching and help IFMA reach more FMs like you. And for more great content like you saw today, or to catch up on our previous webinars, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Enable notifications and to stay up to date from the latest from IFMA. Thank you again, Doug, Ted, Stephen, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a wonderful and, rest of your day. And uh, thank you for uh, to IFMA for allowing us to talk about this topic today. See y'all. Thank Bye. you. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you.